Hello, everyone. Welcome to Photobox Group Head Office in London. Um, just a little bit about Photobox. We have five brands, Photobox, Moonpig um, in the UK, Poster XXL in Germany, based in Munich. Um, we have Hoffman in um, Spain, and we now have Greets, based out of Netherlands. And we also service Australia, as far as I know, and whoever else that wants to order globally can. So we're a global company. My background is um, I'm, a, I'm a business student who ended up in the SOC somehow. I ended up uh, patching and doing PKI and firewall changes and I just learned as I went really. Um, and then I got into risk management because I thought it's, it's a place that I can do a lot more. And uh, I was in banking, I was in a, three different banks and then um, went to Thomson Reuters, did a little bit at KPMG, oil and gas at BP and now I'm here. Um, one of the things about the team, and I'll talk about it a, a bit more later, it's the first time I've seen risk and security really come together and not be two separate functions. A lot of times everybody says, what does the risk team do? So risk management is strategic and requires a lot of collaboration, reflection, thinking, and just knowing everyone everywhere. Whoops. Sorry, what do they do, what do they care about, um, and how can we help them? We enable people to make the right decisions. So not only the business about um, what is it that you should be doing, where should you be focusing, but also our, our own technology and security teams. We tell them this is, this is the next project you should be going and asking for money for, and this is how you should be doing it. So we really help people to make decisions. So how do we do that? Um, someone finds an issue. So our team is made up of um, AppSec people. They are the ones that know the applications inside out. They know all the things that are wrong with it. We have a SOC who monitor things. They look at logs all day long. We have incident response, and they're the ones who see all the problems manifest into something real. So they find all these issues. Then we build a story for them, and I'll, I'll tell you how, but that's why I'm here. And then we take that to our stakeholders, who are the people who have something to lose, and we present it to management, who are the people who control um, the wallets, basically. And then we affect change, and that's the biggest part of what risk management does. Risk management is not an instant grat gratification kind of role. It's not, there's an incident, I worked on it for three days, I'm now done, move to the next thing. It takes a long time to develop the right process, you have to keep going through it, it takes a lot of dedication and saying, I didn't get it last time, I didn't get it right last time, let me fix it a little bit and a little bit and a little bit. So it's just a lot of continuous improvement. But I can change the direction and risk posture of the company with one slide. So it's a really powerful job to have, really. So let's go back to that flow again. Um, we find stuff as a team. So these are all the things, and this is just a generic slide about everything that's out there in the industry right now. So as you can see, there's IoT, mobile, behavior detection, cloud security, quantum encryption, continuous network visibility, oh my God, like just all these amazing things. And you get all this data and you say, now what do I do with all this information that I know? We're in a really big information overload environment these days. Our processes, as I said, um, risk management is kind of an ongoing tweak a little bit, tweak a little bit, tweak a little bit. So up here we have uh, in JIRA, we do everything in JIRA. Um, we have our vulnerability management process. And over here, we have our risk management process because they're different. A vulnerability is a single issue on its own or a couple of issues coming together. And you need to know how big is it? How quickly should I react? What should I do about it? Um, who can approve it, et cetera? When did the acceptance get expired? And then the risk is really the story that you tell to um, to your management team or to, again, those stakeholders, which is why you need to treat them differently. So this is one of the things that um, having seen it not work in reality in other places, I really wanted to do it differently here. Who knows about Information Beautiful, the web, Information is Beautiful, the website? 
okay, decent number. So four hands, which I'm still surprised about. It's the best website out there, honestly. If you want to kill a couple of hours, information is beautiful. And now it's called Knowledge is Beautiful. So they have two of them. And he has a book too. So I saw this a long time ago, and I've always, I've always stuck to it. So he says, in order to have a good data visualization presentation, you need to have information or data, you need to have a story, you need to have a goal, and you need to have a visual form. And a couple of things he says that are really interesting is, if you have information, if you have the goal, and if you have the form, without the story, you're boring. And if you have the visuals and the information and the story without the purpose, then you're useless. So here at Photobox, we're neither boring nor useless, which is why we make sure, yes, we have Photobox group, which is why we have all four of these things when we tell the stories to our stakeholders and our management team. So how do we use data to make decisions? One of the things we realized pretty early on, and again, having seen it in the past, is that you really need to know who's who, okay? So you need to know who are the tech people that you should be talking to, either in security or in the rest of the technology organization? Who are the, who are the business people or other partners, let's say in architecture or something, that you have to work with closely? Who are the SMEs and the champions that are going to help you get that message across? And then who are the management owners? Who's the C-level who could be going to jail if this thing happened? Okay, so you need to know who's who at what level. And again, that's another, um, that's another picture that I really like. It says, you take data, which is the facts, you turn it into information, and then you use knowledge. And one thing I hadn't realized, knowledge is that secret sauce that every single one of us bring, okay? So that's not something that can be put into a book. It's literally, that's why there's a picture of a brain. So you really need humans. And there's even um, talks now about whether or not AI and all that stuff can replace that. And there's still, we're still so far from that, that we're all still gonna be needed for a long time, thankfully. And then you take all of that and then you make a decision from there. So, this is what we're used to seeing. When I got here four months ago, we had a bunch of PDFs that we would send out to people. Again, the team had done a great job with what we had at the time, but it says, here's our medium risks, here's our low risk, here's the high risk. That one's risk approved, this one's awaiting acceptance, a little bit of a description, please sign here. So this is a traditional way of giving a risk report. Where are we going now? One of the things we're trying to do is to start putting things into buckets. So we have, let's say, 1,500 vulnerabilities that we found over the years, okay? I need to be able to tell um, these 300 things come up to this one thing in access control which comes up to this one risk that my board will understand. So as you can see at the top, we have all the vulnerabilities and then in the middle, we have all the brand level risks. So this is something that's specific to a business. And right at the bottom, there will be a handful of things that affects the organization. So this is how we're turning that huge sea or ocean of information that we have into risks. But still, it's nothing out of the ordinary. So this is the funnel. So about six months ago, I met Dennis, the CISO here. And I highly urge you, the, the um, URL is down there, to go and look at this presentation. And there's this guy talking about thinking in graphs. And it's like, what does that mean? And he, he has this presentation, and it's like, I don't know, 80 slides or something. And he goes through it in 10 minutes. It's just the fastest thing you'll ever meet. But it's like, bang, 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 bang. So if you just look at that, Graphs and security. So if you look at that and you think, what is that? Hyperlinks in graphs. He has pictures of how code is graphs. He has pictures of how thoughts are graphs. Everything is a graph. So when I got here, after deciding I did want to work here after all, I had to start seeing things and thinking in the same way. It's just the only way I've realized now that you can actually because a picture speaks a thousand words, as they say, right? So it's the only way you can really take all that information and show in a simple one pager what you're talking about. So this is another thing I saw in that presentation. This is a, a 
graph of everything currently in our JIRA. If you were to take all of those things, which we have, and put it into a graph, this is what it looks like, which is mind-boggling. So this is where we're going. This is a GDPR data journey. So right in the center, we have the data journey. Let's call it um, payroll. And then you have all the risks, all the vulnerabilities, all the assets, everything that's impacted by that. So every time I accept a risk, I see the upstream, downstream, cross-stream, everything, the world of impact accepting that one risk makes or fixing one risk makes. Who did I just make happy? Let me go talk to them and say, do you realize that you're a user of a system that takes information from another system that then feeds another system that we just fixed this major vulnerability on and then we can go and have those conversations. And that one is one of our projects. So this is how we show how many vulnerabilities, how many risks, how many assets is a project impacting. And as you can see, this is where we're starting to get to a point where we can really show interdependencies and show the value of what every single team in security is doing. Without having visualizations like this with the amount of information that we get these days, it would literally be impossible for us to do this. What I want you to take away today, and I think I've been a lot quicker because I was rushing through it uh, because we're running a bit late, but maybe not anymore. Um, what I wanted you to take away today is that don't be afraid of graphs. I was when I first saw it. Dennis has this, um, he has a philosophy about our JIRA. Think of it as a GRC tool. If you don't know what it is, I didn't until I came here. Um, that anyone can put stuff in it, right? So I was very scared when I heard, what do you mean anyone can raise a vulnerability? What do you mean anyone can raise a risk? But the thing is, you don't actually end up missing anything. Whereas in a lot of other places where things are closed, where only people who should have access to something have access to it, then other people who have things in their head don't get a chance to have their, wor their, uh, their thoughts heard. One of the things I've realized as I've been talking to a lot of people around the business who don't go into JIRA is that they really do have some interesting thoughts and some reflections about security. And until you start poking them and asking them and making them think that way and helping them realize that their thoughts actually are important and impactful to the security posture of the business, people just don't see it that way. So yeah, this is what we're doing in uh, Graphs for Risk. Thank you. Thank you.